for giving you this presentation. Um, the Freda Minch Portuguese American Archives is part of the Claire T. Carney Library specifically. We are a collection within Archives and Special Collections Department. We have the, high, the largest collection of historical materials documenting the experience of Portuguese Amer immigrants and their descendants, and our scope is national. We house a wide variety of things including genealogical records, although that is not our focus, uh, newspapers, books, recordings, family photographs, um, you name it, I very likely have it somewhere within our archive, including a wine barrel that is actually housed underneath my desk because I don't know where else to store it uh, because of its size and shape. And the reason I am here is because we generate and support the study and understanding of the Portuguese American experience um, the experience, the history, and the culture of Portuguese American communities. And we contribute to the preservation, understanding, and teaching of local culture, especially Portuguese ethnic culture, hence the Rehoboth. Okay, so um, this is a very quick lesson on Portuguese American immigration. It is not intended um, to cover everything. Um, there have been many theses, a uh, PhD theses, um, researched and published on one small aspect of what I'm going to be talking to you about. So um, the, num the first thing you need to know is that the overwhelming number of Portuguese immigrants to the United States were from the Azores and the Madeiran arch arch archipelagos. U.S. immigration laws were radically different um, in the 19th and early part of the 20th century than what we generally know about in the 21st century. And Portugal required its citizens to have authorization to leave the country. And this had very significant uh, financial implications. So what were the pull factors? What made people want to come to the US? For Portuguese American immigration, there are four specific reasons. Whaling. And whaling, um, started in the late 1700s, or the pull started in the late 1700s, but it truly ended by about 1850, 1860, um, even though they were doing whale hunting until right up until um, the mid 1900s. Uh, but the whaling for New Bedford truly ended at about 1860. Um, it was definitely done by the 1870s. Then we have the Industrial Revolution, which started officially in the U.S. in 1820 and, and lasted until about 1870. And when I'm talking about the Industrial Revolution, I'm talking about the textile mills for the case of New England. So the vast quantity of labor that was required in the textile mills was very attractive um, for many populations, but the Portuguese in particular. And I'm gonna be talking, um, and you'll find out why when I talk about the push factors. Then we have the Azorian Refugee Act of 1958. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, later on. And then the Immigration Act of 1965, and I'll also go, uh, talk about this at length. So what were the push factors? What were the reasons that people left? The two main ones are land ownership, um, so the Azores has nine islands. Of those nine islands, um, the four most populated, um, actually, let me take that back. Um, the ones that people tend to think about is actually the way it really is. So we're talking about San Miguel, San Jorge, Fayal, Santa Maria, uh, and Pico. Um, the majority of land was owned by, by a very small minority of families. So a very small number of families owned a lot of the land and then they leased that land, they rented that land to the rest of the population who worked it. And when you don't own your own land, the financial difficulties can be, um, can be very difficult to overcome if you have a bad harvest bad harvest you can't pay your rent, um, if there's a natural disaster you can't pay your rent, um, if you don't have enough people to work the land you can't pay your own rent. Um, and then at the same time we have military service. Portugal had a mandatory um, military service requirement uh, for all males and the, um, the requirement kicked in as young as 12 
and you had up until the age of 25 um, to fulfill it. If you did not want to fulfill the military service, you actually had to pay for an exemption. So what we end up having is a number of individuals who buy illegal passports, because remember, I told you that Portugal required you to have authorization to leave the country. This military service is one of the reasons. So you had to buy, um, you either bought the exemption, but there was, it was a belief that the exemptions were too expensive. So people would buy illegal passports in order to bypass the exemption, get on a ship and then travel. While there were a number of stowaways, um, general passenger ships, it was very difficult to be a stowaway on, on one of those. So when we hear the stories of, well, somebody was on, a, was on a ship and then they sort of happened to casually get off in New Bedford or Providence and, you know, they were my great grandfather. Those stories tend to be tied more to whaling and you really only were able to do that at the very end of the voyage. So they had already received your employment um, and you may sort of get off the ship and never go back to the Azores um, afterwards. But it really, um, it was really only during the whaling period and um, the numbers aren't as high as we often hear. Um, although there are no official numbers either. And then we have the Kapuinj eruptions, which ties back to the Azorian Refugee Act. So um, Fayal, uh, one of the nine islands, has an, um, has an active volcano and it erupted in 1957. And a politician you may have heard of by the name of John F. Kennedy, who was a senator at the time um, from Martha's Vineyard, so very familiar with the Portuguese American community. And while in the Senate, he got the Azorian Refugee Act passed, which uh, became law in 1958 and then was extended into, um, in 1960 for, not, for an additional year. And what that Refugee Act allowed was for individuals who had been affected by the volcano to come to the United States as refugees. Why is this important? Um, I'm going to be talking about sort of the laws that were in place at the time in the U.S. and why this was an, an extraordinary measure, but also um, that Immigration Act of 1965, it ties into that as well, because although the numbers, it is a little bit difficult to know exactly how many people came, but the estimate is somewhere between two to 5,000. So not a huge number of people, but when we had a change in the immigration law in 65, those, that small number of people had a fairly significant impact, and I'll be talking about why that was a little bit later. And then we have the Stab Novo, which was the dictatorial uh, government that was in place from 1926 to 1974. And um, as we can all suspect, whenever somebody um, is is living within a difficult government as a dictatorship is, there is always a desire to leave. Um, however, note that 1926 uh, date, um, they could leave, but not to the US for a significant number of years, six, until 67 to be specific. So um, where did they go between 26 and 67? They went to Canada. Um, some of a uh, vast majority went to Brazil. Um, funny enough, not to Europe. Um, that tended to be where um, continental Portuguese went. Uh, the Europeans, Portu Europe, um, Azorean Portuguese, for the most part, did not migrate to parts of Europe. Um, it was um, honestly, it was more work than it was worth. <laughs> you had to go to mainland Portugal and then travel to another European country. Um, Spain also had the dictatorial government during this time, so you, um, it was all sorts of issues. It was actually easier to come through the Atlantic than it was to go the other way. So, you may be wondering, but I've heard about plantation work in Hawaii. Yes, this was contract labor. Small number of individuals, again, we're talking anywhere between 10 to 20,000, um, recruited predominantly from Madeira and San Miguel because they were, fam they were familiar with um, semi-tropical crops, uh, specifically pineapple and oranges. 
you may also be thinking, but I've heard about the dairy work. Yes, for California. So the plantation work in Hawaii is specifically between 1880 and 1921. Dairy work starts as early as the 1870s with the gold rush. And then once the gold is all gone, they settle into farms, which they adopt as dairy farms. Um, and then it lasts all through the present day. Um, the vast majority of dairy that is produced in California actually come is produced by Portuguese Americans. And then you're thinking, but I, what about all these fishermen? Um, Portuguese came from islands, they clearly must be fishermen. No, they weren't. So there was fishing, there was um, cod, cod fish, um, cod fish fishing. Um, but that was a very early enterprise. We're talking about the 1920s and the 1930s. Um, and there were some who settled in New Bedford after spending their time fishing, but um, the number is fairly small. Um, it was predominantly a um, Portuguese Canadian enterprise actually. Um, and then we have tuna also out in San Diego. Present day, um, the fishermen that most people assume um, are part of this historical immigration are actually from mainland Portugal, specifically from the area of Ilovu, um, uh, Figueira de Foz, and um, they were fishermen, they were fishing through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And again, um, it's a small number, it's in the hundreds, and they all come from one specific area in mainland Portugal. Um, so that's for fishing. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the numbers. Again, if anybody wants more information, I can absolutely share, the, share more information with them. And anybody who wants a copy of the PowerPoint, please let me know. I share my email at the end of the PowerPoint and I will gladly give you my PowerPoint and any other information um, you may be interested in. So um, Portuguese immigration to the United States is usually talked about in a matter of waves. So if you look at this, it kind of, you've got, we've got two crescendos. The first crescendo, the first wave um, happens between 1900 and the number ends in 29, but really it's 24, 27. This was more for a statistical um, presentation. Um, and that is considered the first wave. The second wave, again, the number says 1960, but it really starts in 67 and it ends in 1988. I'm gonna tell you why 88 very specifically. So the waves, the first wave, um, is directly tied in to whaling, the textile industry and Hawaiian contract labor, and it's specifically the textile industry for New England. And it's an estimated 192,000 individuals who migrated to the US during this period. The second wave, again, lasted from 67 to 88, and um, it includes the Azorian Refugee Act and the Immigration Act of 65, and there's an estimated 200,000, a little bit over um, 218,000 Portuguese individuals who migrate during this period. So very quickly, the Portuguese by the top eight states, we've got 1900. Um, you'll see that Massachusetts has a higher number than California, so percentile wise, um, it's much larger in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. That changes by, um, 2010, you'll now see that California has a higher number. But the thing to note about Massachusetts is between New Bedford and Fall River, so and then all the towns in between, we have the highest concentration of Portuguese Americans. So California has the highest number, but between specifically New Bedford and Fall River, we have the highest concentration. This is because in California, they're all spread out through the San Joaquin Valley. And then we have Rhode Island, which doesn't lag that far behind at 100,000 and 7.2% of the population. Florida um, is an interesting case. I'm not gonna get into it. The numbers are increasing because of retirees. We also have a significant Brazilian population, um, which sometimes politically gets mixed in with the Portuguese because of the language spoken, so we have to be a little bit careful about these numbers. So why do these specific dates? 
1924, I'm going to be talking about this. 1958, I've already talked about this. And then 1965, I'm going to talk about this again. Um, 88, Portugal joins the European Union. Right? When Portugal joins the European Union, you're not, you now have free movement between all member countries, which allows for an increased access to employment opportunities. There are now significant financial grants being, being awarded to Portuguese, specifically Azorians. So the push to leave is no longer there because you have an increase in financial opportunities. So this 1924, I am not going to read all of this text. 1924 Immigration Act is also known as the Quota Act. And what happens is the, is the American government decides that there's too many unwanted immigrants coming in. These unwanted immigrants were specifically from Southern Europe. Portugal is part of Southern Europe, South, um, Southwestern Europe to be specific. So what they decide is that every country will be given an allowed number of individuals. There is a formula that's used um, that is based on the 1890 census. And Portugal gets a grand total of 503 immigrants. That's a very small number. And those are 503 immigrants who must meet the now much more difficult um, entry uh, requirements. You must be literate. Um, you must be, you, you always had to be employable, but now you must even be more employable because the US is interested in getting other populations here rather than the Southwestern Europeans. So um, let me just go back here for a second. What does this mean? Um, colloquially, it essentially means that Portuguese American immigration stops in 1924. Um, some could argue 1927, but it's really 1924. And um, we see this statistically. We saw that the numbers drop considerably when I showed you the waves. So, um, why are you supposed to care about Section 10 of the 1924 Immigration Act? Um, you should care because if you're inter interested in doing Portuguese American genealogy, Portuguese American um, immigration research, you need to know that this particular section states that in order for an immigrant to re-enter the U.S. after the enactment of the 24 Act, they needed to have a re-entry visa. And we have to ask ourselves, was anybody telling non-citizens that they needed these re-entry visas? And if so, in what language? I can tell you that I have found no evidence of this being transmitted to the Portuguese community. So what happened to the non-citizens who went on an extended vacation on the cusp of 24, who left and didn't know that they, that they needed that special re-entry visa? Well, they couldn't come back. So um, I've been in my job for 11 years and every so often, I would hear a story about, you know, my grandmother, my grandfather um, had their kids in the US and then they went to the, you know, they went back to Portugal on vacation and then, you know, for some reason they couldn't come back. And I'm like, oh, that doesn't really seem right. Or I'd hear um, my, uh, my great aunt and my great uncle or even my aunt and uncle, depending on the age. Um, you know, they were, they were American citizens, but they couldn't, their parents weren't here and I'm just not quite sure. It took me quite a number of years and a um, more thorough reading of the 24 Immigration Act than I actually ever thought I'd wanted to do to figure out about this Section 10. There were families that were caught where um, they were on vacation. They left the country without knowing, or even after 24, they left the country without knowing that they needed this special visa in order to come back. And they were literally denied entry um, back into the US. I am going to apologize, I have a dog and you may hear him, hopefully he won't be barking, but you may hear him scratch himself. So um, we also have, so this happens in 1924, and then in 1965, we have the Family Reunification Act. It actually, it's actually called um, the Heart Seller Act. And what it does is it says, we no longer work on a quota number, on a quota system. We will now allow 
family reunification. So American citizens who have relatives who live outside of the country may sponsor their relatives to come in. What in Portuguese is actually called a carta de chamada, a calling letter, it's actually a visa. Um, as a child, I actually always thought it was a literal letter um, because of the name. So remember how I mentioned that in 1958, you have that Azorian Refugee Act? Well, now you have, you know, let's just call it 5,000, 5,000 freshly arrived Azorians who find out that if they become American citizens, ASAP, they can now call, they can sponsor their families to come. And that has a significant impact in California and Massachusetts where these newly arrived um, refugees settled. They did not go to Hawaii because that was an older population that did not have fresh um, new settlement as part of the 58 Refugee Act. So um, I'm just, I'm not gonna go um, too much into detail with this. I usually go quite far when I'm doing genealogically based um, presentations. Um, but in general, everybody knows that complication laws, that immigration laws are very complicated, but it really is crucial to know about them if you're doing immigration research or genealogical research. An example is the Expatriation Act passed in 1907. So any American woman who marries a foreigner shall take the nationality of her husband. It didn't matter if you were US born. The minute you married a non-citizen, you lost your citizenship. And I saw this happen because as part of this presentation, I took a deep, deep dive into the 1920 and 1930 census, censuses. And I saw women in the 1920 census who were US born their place of birth said very clearly Massachusetts, but they were identified as being aliens. So this was actually um, overturned in uh, 1922. But remember how we had that 1924 immigration quota law? So even though it was overturned in 22, you now had to apply for citizenship. And you may not have known that you lost your citizenship when you married a non-citizen. So you may have lost your citizenship. You may not be aware that there's an immigration quota, you know, that's section 10. So you go on vacation with your family, assuming that you can come back and you actually can't because you've been deemed a non-citizen. So this, this complicates things quite significantly. Um, and it is important to know about these kinds of things when you're doing Portuguese American immigration research. So let's talk about the Portuguese in Rehoboth. Hopefully the reason why you're here today. Um, I started off by seeing what Rehoboth uh, history books had to say about the Portuguese. And I only found one book, um, A History of Rehoboth, Massachusetts by Tilton, who had two mentions of the Portuguese. On page 250, he says the Portuguese farmers are bringing the strawberry into cultivation again as their numerous children enable them to harvest the crop economically. I read that with a little bit of sarcasm. Not all of them had the large families that he uh, purports them to have. I know because I saw the census. Um, and then in page 366, where he is going through the long list of well-known um, Rehoboth families, um, well-known, well-established, um, John F. Uh, Chase? No, a Marvel, I'm sorry. So John F. Marvel, um, clearly a very well-to-do, part of a very well-to-do family, um, traveled to the Azores, um, as part of the, in the, in the bark called the Veronica. Um, and then in 88, in 82, he goes to Madeira. Um, but that's really the only two mentions of the Portuguese in any book um, that talks about Rehoboth history, the historical ones. And then I came across a little something called the vital record of Rehoboth 18, eight, um, 1642 to 1896 compiled by James Arnold. 
And yeah, he mentions the Portuguese. But man, oh man, is this book problematic for anybody who's doing Portuguese American genealogy or research. All of the Portuguese names have been anglicized. All of them. Um, there are insane variations for last names, like Souza, S-O-N-S-A, S-O-S-A, S-O-U-S-I-A, um, S-O-Z-A. And then there's some first names here that I can't even figure out what they could possibly be in Portuguese. So it's an interesting one, and I, I will likely be spending some time with it in the future, but it couldn't be the basis of this presentation today because it, it really is very problematic with how the names have been changed. Um, and there's some names where I just can't, because of the level of information, I just can't figure out um, if they are truly a Portuguese family or not. So what did I do? I went to the census and I specifically looked at the 1920 and 1930 census. So in 1920, Rehoboth had 2,065 citizens, which was actually an increase of 3.2% from the previous year. By 1930, it actually had 2,600 um, citizens, which was an increase of 26%. That's a significant increase. <coughs> how, did the port how did the Portuguese fit into this? And I hand calculated these numbers, the, um, the Portuguese aspect of it, so that there is a margin of error to this. But so in 1920, there was 547 families, which, was, which meant that the Portuguese made up 26% of the whole population of Rehoboth. By 1930, we've got 577 families, but they're only 22%. So you're wondering, well, Rehoboth had this huge increase in population, why were the Portuguese only 22% at this point? Remember 1924? People stopped being allowed to come back into the US, to come into the US, and that had an impact locally. One of the reasons that the population of Rehoboth um, increased is that, um, I, actually there's two reasons that I can account for. One is there is a notable uh, number of Armenians settling in Rehoboth, and that has to do with what was happening in Armenia at the time. Um, and then the other reason is in the 1920s, there was mass, mass real estate being, um, mass quantities of real estate being sold, and Rehoboth had land to be sold. So people who otherwise did not own land were settling, um, we're coming from other parts of the South Coast for the most part and settling in, um, in Rehoboth, they're buying land. Um, what's really interesting, and I'd have to do some deeper research into this, is I looked at the 1927-28 city directory lists and there's a number of households listed in the city directory that are not identified in the 1930 census um, and it's, it tends to be significantly, signif significantly homes or very small scale farms, but it's predominantly homes rented by unmarried men and women. These unmarried men and women are not noted in the census at all. So these are the names that I found um, in both censuses. It's a long list. I'm not gonna go through them all. Um, in some cases, the Portuguese, in some cases, we have both the Portuguese and the recorded name being used interchangeably. Um, in some cases, um, it is only the recorded name and I've provided the, the Portuguese variant or the Portuguese um, or original name so you know what it's based on. Um, and I have a, just gonna, I don't know if this is gonna work for me, no. So I actually have, oh, here we go. I actually have a master list. Um, hopefully you're able to see this. I have a master list that I've gathered um, from a large number of sources of known um, US modification uh, to Portuguese names. And these are consistent changes. So names um, that were changed once and then remained changed. 
when you're looking at the census, um, I saw names that were written one way in 1920 and then written in a completely different way in 1930 and then in the city directory we were written in a completely different way again. So these are the known permanent changes. Let me flick back to the PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see this. And again, I'll share this happily with anybody who'd like to see it. Um, trying to keep an eye on the time. So there are names that were not modified, and that's the list on the left. The two names that are asterisked, Alfonso and Diolinda, for the most part tend to be first names. So um, those two require a little bit further research to figure out if they were indeed the last name of somebody in, um, who immigrated or if that was a name that was given to them when they got here for a number of reasons. And then there's a list of names that I, for the life of me, could not figure out what the, what the original Portuguese version was. And that's the list on the right. So, when did the foreign born arrive in the US? Oh, let me just go back here for a second. This number here, it's, um, it's Portuguese. And the way that Portuguese, ha that I've identified Portuguese is everybody who is not only foreign born, but also the children of foreign born parents. So anybody who was identified um, as having parents who were born in Portugal, that's, that's where I came up with that 547 and 577. Here, this chart is specifically the number of people who were not born in the US. And not surprisingly, you see that between um, 1900 and 1915, actually in 1920, we also have our own wave in Rehoboth um, because we mirror the bigger national trend of when the Portuguese were arriving in the US. So where were they coming from? Not surprisingly, the vast majority, the overwhelming majority comes from San Miguel. And that is because that was the island that had the tightest um, hold on land, the smallest number of families owning the biggest portion of land. It, it was something like four families owned uh, like 70% of the island. Um, uh, so we've got San Miguel is at the forefront, then Fayal, and Saint Georges are the next two. There are um, 34 individuals who are only listed as coming from Portugal in the Azores. And I'm going to be talking about this shortly. Um, I did list Bermuda because Bermuda had a um, throughout the years has had a, um, a very interesting relationship with the Azores, where they actually have. Um, employment recruitment contracts where Azorians are allowed to work in Bermuda usually up to um, five to ten years. So we had two individuals who whose parents went on to Bermuda work there and then had to leave and that's where their children were born. We have five who were born in California so their parents likely settled out there first and then ultimately ended up in, um, uh, in Rehoboth. Um, we have one in Brazil because Brazil was one of them, uh, the Portuguese government actually paid your passage if you were willing to go to Brazil, um, but it wasn't for everybody, so a lot of families left. And then we actually had two individuals who were born at sea, and I thought it'd be pretty cool to tell you that. So what did they do? 74 individuals worked on what is known, what was known in 1930. This is specifically 1930. So these numbers are 1920. Um, and then these numbers are 1930, and I'm gonna, um, I had to go with the 1920 for geography because of a problematic census taker, census enumerator. Um, 1930, um, he had to stand, the information he collected for this part was standardized, so he, um, he had to give an answer. Um, there wasn't, he couldn't do whatever the heck he wanted. So 74 were farm laborers, um, owned a general farm, and a general farm, um, is that you grew pretty much a lot of different things. <laughs> um, and um, 31 worked on these general farms, six had home farms, and I'm, I'm having a hard time um, identifying the legal definition of a home farm, but it, they appear to be small farms within the general farm. 
And then uh, two were identified as being vegetable wifers. Um, and I don't know, I, I speculate that that meant that their husbands had general farms and they sold the vegetables that were grown. Um, one had a truck farm and that meant that they, um, they only grew vegetables and they sold those vegetables. One had a poultry farm and which meant that it could be anything between chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, and eggs. And then we have a wide, um, it's, a, it's not a, an expansive list of other professions, um, but there's some interesting things in here. Like we have a, fun, a furniture upholsterer. We have two who worked at a gas station. Um, and I am not, I have to admit, I'm not very familiar with the um, history of Rehoboth in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, but I'm pretty sure we can figure out which gas station that was. Um, two, surprisingly, uh, not surprisingly, women were housekeepers for, for families. Um, we had a fireman who worked for Standard Oil. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go through everything, but um, I thought it was a very interesting list. So, Mr. William C. Francis, he was a census enumerator in 1920 and 1930. And man, oh man, I've been polite when I say he wasn't very good at his job. In fact, he was horrible at his job. Had a good penmanship, but data-wise, horrible. So um, he lists everybody as being born in Portugal or the Azores Islands. He does not list the islands, whereas in 1920, in some previous uh, censuses, um, the actual island is listed. Um, he just called everyone Anton. Didn't matter if your name was Antonio, didn't matter if your name was Anthony. For him, you became Anton. He anglicized a lot of first name spellings. One of the examples is somebody was called Jack, um, which is also not a Portuguese name. It's actually um, a French name, but he just called him Jack. And then uh, the most problematic for me is that he was horrible with dates. Um, there are significant date discrepancies in the arrival dates noted between 1920 and 1930. In one case of specifically of John Faria, Joan Faria, there's a 12 year difference between the date that is given in 1920 and the date that is given in 1930. And this is why I use the 1920 dates because they seem much more reliable than, I, than the 1930 dates. Um, other dates don't make sense either, like the case of Joaquin uh, Ferrier, which whom actually I believe his name is Joaquin Faria. And I'm just gonna read, um, I don't have a visual example for you, so I'm just gonna read this. So, um, Joaquin arrived in the U.S. in 1894. His wife, who was written as Alvero, but very likely her name was Alvina, also arrives in 1894. They have a son named James, not his name, very likely Jaime, who, um, who was written as having arrived in 1919. James is 17 which means that in 1930, he would have been born in 1913. But if his mother arrived from the Azores in 1894, how could he have been born in the Azores in 1913? And nothing that I am aware of talks about the Portuguese women getting pregnant, traveling back, giving birth there, leaving their children, and then subsequently paying, like having to pay, a, and then bringing their children back. Because now we're talking about three different passages, passage there, passage back, and then a passage for their child. That was way more money than they had, so they wouldn't have done that. So I truly can't figure out um, what is going on with those dates. He clearly screwed up somewhere. And then there's this example. So I know this is very small and um, aesthetically, I just couldn't make this big enough to make sense, but um, I'll be reading it out to you. So we have a name by the name of George F. de Souza, who was written as coming from Scotland. Really doesn't make a lot of sense. The Souza is very much a Portuguese name. But then his wife is written as coming from the Azor, um, Azor Islands. His mother-in-law is also named De Souza, 
and also comes from the Azor Islands. And his wife and mother-in-law are both recorded as arriving in 1898. However, this doesn't make sense because you're supposed to answer the, the, um, the census as if you're the head of the house. So if he was born in Scotland, his, his mother-in-law wouldn't have had the same last name that he had. So we have questions. Why does a man from Scotland have a Portuguese surname? How does a mother-in-law have the same surname as her son-in-law? And how does a mother-in-law herald from a completely different ethnic identification as the child she is supposedly related to, right? So there's problems here. Um, what I actually, for this particular case, I did do a little bit further digging. And um, Caroline, who is, at, who is his wife, is the one who was Scottish. I was able to figure that out through um, some genealogical research. Um, and I believe that um, this was a matter of transposing, um, that um, it was very likely Caroline who answered it and um, her English, because she was Scottish, very likely confused our census taker here, who, like I said, was not very good at his job. So let's have a look at um, a few families of Rehoboth, of early Rehoboth. So I started off, I did look at the 1900 census just very casually, and we have somebody by the last name of Padre Nossa. Very unusual last name. Um, I cannot find evidence of this last name anywhere else. Um, it is very likely not the name that was, um, that this individual, that this family, that Manuel, um, who's the head of the household, had in Portugal. Somewhere along the way, it became Padre Nossa. Padre Nossa means our father, like the Catholic prayer. Um, so in 1900, he has um, a wife, Marion, very likely Mariana, a son named George, and a daughter named Mary. In the 1920 census, um, he has, um, a, by this point, he still has George, Mary, and now he has a son called Frank. Um, so Manuel was born in May of 1865. He immigrated in 86. Um, Marion was born in um, 67, immigrated in 92. They are both from the island of Piku, and they, um, they married circa 1894. How do I know this number? Because in the 1900 census, it asks them how long they had been married, um, and the answer is six years. So that's how we get to the 1894. Now, I'm going to get on a little bit of a soapbox. Be very careful with ancestry when you're doing Portuguese American genealogy, a genealogical research. Not only are none of these names transcribed properly, I've actually never seen such bad transcription as the, as the transcription I saw for Rehoboth. Um, truly horrific. Um, but there are some, um, some family trees on there with very wrong information. Um, that have the word Piku, um, so the island of Piku, as being a village in San Miguel. So be very careful. Always go back to the original document. Don't take anything on ancestry um, at face value. So um, sadly, their daughter, um, Mary, Maria, um, died at the age of 26 um, and uh, through the um, obituary which was published in the Diario de Noticias, the New Bedford um, daily newspaper on May 7th 1925, um, we learned that she was 26 years of age, that her father actually had the middle initials GR, and that um, her funeral was at the um, Igreja de São Pedro, 
St. Peter's Church in, in North Dighton, um, formerly 280 Main Street. And interestingly, the majority of Portuguese were actually um, had their funeral masses um, at St. Peter's Church. Um, they also were supposedly buried at St. Peter's, but I can't find any evidence that St. Peter's had a cemetery, so I'm missing the connection somewhere. Um, and you all likely know this, but I'm just going to tell it to you anyways, because as a historian and as a genial, um, as an archivist, a librarian, I feel like it's my obligation. So, um, so St. Peter's and St. Joseph's merged um, around 2008 to become St. Nicholas of Mira. Um, some other churches that the Portuguese attended were St. Dominic's in Swansea, and also um, Holy, um, the big Portuguese church in Fall River. So then I came across um, this delightful little bit. I always get excited about divorces during this time period because they were, they were unusual. A divorce was unusual during this time period. So I'm going to read it to you in Portuguese very quickly. No tribunal competente desta cidade, João Valério de Rehoboth, requereu o divórcio de sua mulher, Maria Valério, da mesma localidade. Valério declarou que sua mulher o abandonara em Siconque no dia 20 de abril de 1924. Casaram na cidade de Providence, a 26 de julho de 1919, de cujo consórcio houve uma criança que nasceu a 21 de março de 1920. So, very quickly. John Valerio, as he is known um, throughout the censuses, João Valerio, um, requested a divorce in this court, and this was specifically in Taunton, so he went to the court, Taunton court and asked for a divorce from his wife, Maria, who he had married on July 26, 1919, and who, according to this article, had abandoned him in Seekonk. Even I know that Seekonk isn't that far away from Rehoboth. And they, um, they had, a, as a result of this marriage, there was a child who was actually born in March of 1920. So I do a little digging and what do I find out? Let's start with the 1930 census. So by 1930, uh, John is remarried. He's got a parcel of kids. Um, he is living in Rehoboth, which is why I'm, I'm mentioning him. And there's that son that was mentioned in that announcement, Joseph, who is 10 at this point, which falls in line with what we had read um, with him being born in 1920. By 1940, he's living in East Providence. So um, Valerio, John, marries Maria in 1919, divorces her in 1927 after being separated since 1924. They have one child in 1920. He marries Margaret in 27, and their first child with, is also born in 27, the same year he asked for a divorce. He thinks that there were some shenanigans going on. Um, and they have at least six more children with her. Um, this was according to the 1940 census. Um, by 1940, he sold the farm in Rehoboth, which he owned and operated as a general farm. And he'd moved to East Providence where he worked for the city doing street, um, doing street maintenance. I'm sorry, I've got an orthographic here there. It's supposed to say um, doing, not during. So I couldn't, I can't find him in the 1920 census. I, I honestly can't, I'm not too sure um, what happened, but I did find him in the 1910 census. And he's living with his father, Michael Valerio, who was born in Portugal. So Michael is very much not his first, not his first name, very likely Miguel. And it's just the two of them. There's no wife, but they have a housekeeper who's 37 and has three kids. So you've got a woman who's a housekeeper who's living in this house with three of her kids. Not going to say that there were shenanigans going on, but there may have been. So, um, the other thing is um, another article I found is um, was published in 1925, and it says that there will be a Holy Ghost feast happening um, tomorrow in Rehoboth, and um, there is going to be a raffle and a free dinner um, at St. Peter's Hall. 
Then I find a 1927 article that talks about the same um, Holy Ghost feast, except now it's happening in August, which is still within the time frame of when the Holy Ghost is celebrated. And this time the feast is happening on the, on the Mateusz de Morel farm. Then I find the 1929 advertisement, and this time the, din the feast is starting in the Manuel Amaral on Blanding Road farm, and there will be a procession over to the Matthew Mateusz Amaral farm on Pine. Now, there are no house numbers um, given in the census for farms, so the best that I can assume is that they lived fairly close to each other because they wouldn't have had them walking for miles. The most would have been half a mile. Um, so somewhere within this intersection um, would have been both farms. And then because I had to do it, not surprisingly, um, the present location for the Holy Ghost Brotherhood is at 43 Broad Street, which is literally 1.5 miles down the road from the 27 and 29 celebrations. And because this is supposed to be about the families, so we have Manuel Amaral, AKA um, Amaral, A-M-O-R-E-L of Blanding Road. He was born in Portugal. He immigrated in 1912. He works at the lumber yard. He's married to Mary B who immigrated in 1905. Her mother lives with them and she, and she too arrived in 1905. And there's two brother-in-laws, but it's unclear who they're siblings to as they were both born in Massachusetts. They're 23 and 22. And then we have that Matthew, um, the Matteo Jamaral, uh, Matthew Amaral with an O of Pine Road, also born in Portugal, immigrated in 1907. Um, he has a general farm. His whole family followed, so his wife and children all followed in 1911, and the three sons work on the home farm. My speculation is that they are either siblings or cousins, but I'd have to do some pretty significant genealogical research in order to be able to confirm that. And then I found the marriage announcement for Sylvester, Sylvester Amaral, who was one of the children of Mateusz, um, who um, according to the marriage announcement was 21 at the time. He was a farmer at Campunij. Um, he lived in Rehoboth and he was getting married to Maria da Oliveira, who um, worked at a textile mill and lived at 17 Scott Street, um, very likely in New Bedford. And this was published in September 15th, 1925. At this point, I would move on to Portuguese American genealogy, but I clearly have too much content for this. I am gonna bypass this section. Um, I will happily talk about this if anybody um, would like me to. I just don't wanna drone on um, because this is quite extensive. I'll just go, um, I'll show you the slides, but I am not gonna talk through them like I would normally do. Um, there's three types of Portuguese American, uh, Portuguese information that you want, baptismal and marriage uh, registration, death registrations, um, and parochial registrations. Um, these are the three websites that where you would go to find some of this information digitized. Um, don't do, don't, don't attempt to do Portuguese genealogy without knowing the date of the event, the village where it happened, the island, or the county. It's, it's impossible. It is truly impossible. You need to have that information. So where are you gonna find it? Reliable family members. If you do genealogy, all of this is gonna make sense to you. Um, names, so many names. I've talked about um, some of the names you saw had D-E or D-A or D-O. Those are just prepositions. They don't mean anything. So our Souza is exactly the same name as the Souza or the Souza, and um, alphabetically, the name gets filed under Souza, except if you're Portuguese, they actually do alphabetization by first name, which confuses people all over. So, um, I've got some Portuguese nicknames. Oh my God, the Marias. Um, no woman born before um, 1973, 74, 75, really 1975 has the first name of Maria without something else. There is always something else, always. What tends to happen is people assume that that second name is her maiden name. It's not, it's a proper first name. It's a two name, it's a two first name combination. When they immigrated, people get confused by two first names. 
my husband and I have this, this discussion all the time. Um, I have a toddler, his name is John David. My husband says his first name is John. I say, no, his first name is John David. It's a conversation that still happens. And in Portugal, it is very, very common to have a first name that is made up of two names. So orthographic agreement happened in 1911. Um, why does this matter? Names like Mello, M-E-L-L-O, started being spelled with one L. So if you have a mellow in your family that is spelled with only one L, one potential clue as to when the family immigrated is that it happened after 1911 because the orthographic change only applied to Portugal. So anybody who was already here didn't change how they spelled their names. Also, some names went from being spelled with a Z to being spelled with an S. Um, the, the word fayal stopped being spelled with a Y and was now spelled with an I. So there's these little clues that you can follow through on. And then this is my email, but I would also, I will also put it in the chat for you. With that, I am going to end and stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. That was fantastic. I will go ahead and unmute everyone. So if you have a question, go ahead and speak up in a second. Please don't be shy. Yep, there we go. I, I would, in defense of um, the census taker in Rehoboth, point out that I have seen a lot of uh, census records, including people who came from English-speaking countries, where the date of immigration is reported very differently in different censuses. I think people didn't always remember or didn't bother to, uh, you know, uh, so. Yes, I don't blame, um, my issue with him is not specifically with the Portuguese, is he was just a bad census taker <laughs> um, in general. So he, um, he was non-discriminatory, changing information for anybody. If I could, I would like to ask two questions. Of course. Regarding the military, mandatory military service, did that apply to both men and women? Do you know? No, um, women were not, um, no, it was, it was just men. Okay. Um, so women would absolutely travel on their own. They would immigrate on their own. The thing to know is that the U.S. government did not allow a single woman to leave the dock on her own. She had to be picked up at the dock by a family member, by somebody who um, would identify themselves as being responsible for them. There is a fear that um, single women would be led astray into life of um, you yeah. know, bad things. Um, yeah, and, oh, go ahead. Um, no, so uh, individual women were absolutely um, um, immigrating on their own. Uh, Portugal did not have women in the military until the 90s. Okay, thank you very much for that one. And then I know that uh, the Portuguese, um, I'm not going to pronounce the word correctly, but the machete, the ukulele to uh, Hawaii. Yes. Was there any, any record that you found about instrument making in uh, Rehoboth by any chance? My research didn't take me um, into that. I wanted to focus on families. Okay. Um, but now I'm intrigued. Is there speculation that the Portuguese introduced a instrument in Rehoboth? Uh, no, I'm just wondering if, if, if there, there had been. I, um, I'm very interested. I became more interested in the history of the ukulele since I started. <laughs> I can't say I'm playing it, but um, it's <laughs> but, but I know about the uh, impact in Hawaii. And it worked its way back to the to the states, and I just wondered. So, yeah, it's um, it was specifically int introduced in Hawaii by by the Madarans. Yeah. Um, so New Bedford, um, I didn't I did not see any evidence as you saw through that um through the map. I didn't see um any Madarans being identified. Right. 
because Madeiran's for the most part settled in New Bedford. Okay. Um, so New Bedford is where you're going to see some of that ukulele playing. Good. Thank you very much. No problem. Yes. I'm, I'm, having, I'm, sorry, I'm having a very hard time understanding. Um, it's, you're coming across like you're uh, a little bit robotic. I'm not sure if there's a problem with the uh, with the microphone. Do you mind typing your question into the chat box and then I'll read it out loud? I'm sorry. Anybody else while we wait for the... Um, as we're waiting, I have put um, I have put my email address in the chat box, so feel free to email me, um, whether it's to get a copy of the PowerPoint or if you have any questions. Um, I do not do genealogical research. I am not a genealogist for hire. Um, I also don't do translations, which tend to be the two questions that I'm um, generally asked the most, but I will certainly talk through um, whether it's your historical research or genealogical research, um, I will talk you through it. I will um, show you where to find information, but I will not do the research for you. It's also a conversation that I have with students on campus. Um, I'll help you find the resources you need for your papers, but I won't write your papers for you. So, yes. Uh, Sonia, yes, thank you so much. What a great presentation. Really, really awesome to hear. and. Um, my family, you know, my dad and uh, uh, his cousin, my aunt, are on this call too. But um, my family uh, came to Rehoboth in that first wave, uh, Santos, uh, 1904, I believe. Dad, can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I was listening to you say how uh, through the waves of, of Portuguese immigrants, they were involved uh, in manufacturing and, um, and, and a lot that was going on in New Bedford and Fall River. So when we look at Rehoboth and see all the farming that was taking place here, is it just based on what was in Rehoboth at the time? Like, obviously there was no manufacturing, but just there's, there's such a large amount of um, agriculture that's happening with all the people that seem to be here from, um, you know, from the slide that you showed. Yes, so um, the port, uh, Portuguese, like many other immigrant communities, so this is not unique to the Portuguese, they go where they have kinship. So um, you go to a place because you've heard that that place has employment, has um, better opportunities. And I talked about um, how the Portuguese, one of the reasons that they left the Azores is because they, they wanted land. They wanted to have that little piece of their own. Rehoboth allowed that for them. So um, there is also a reason why there was large numbers of individuals from San Miguel, because news traveled. So um, it is very possible that when we looked, um, that if we were to look at those 64 families, they would all very likely be from the same um, very close geographic region, because again, news traveled. Um, and then what would be, um, what I saw consistently is that they owned their own land. They, for the most part, they were not renting. So not only did they have these general farms, but they owned their farm. They were not, it was, this was not the case of owning the land, but then traveling to Fall River or traveling to New Bedford to work in the textile mills. They were working in their own land. Um, what you have that is unusual about the Portuguese is that when they settled in industrial cities, when they settled in New Bedford, when they settled in Fall River, up in Lowell, Lawrence, women went to work. 
So the husband worked and the wife worked. Something that, for, that generally you don't tend to have in Italian communities, in Irish American communities, it's only the husband or the sons who are working. In Portuguese families, both genders worked. Wife and, <laughs> wife and husband worked, children, when they reach the age of um, legal, sometimes not so legal, employment, they also worked. So in the case of Rehoboth, um, you have children working the land along their parents, hence those home farms, but also um, there's a number, which I didn't list because it, it could be taken in a number of ways, but I do believe that they um, helps at home. So they were not old enough to be sent uh, to be noted in the census as having their own home farm, but they were clearly working the farm along with the family. Great. That answer your and question? I think, uh, I think the other thing, yeah, it's great. And uh, I think, you know, we need a new history of Rehoboth is really what we need because I think a lot of the, the, um, uh, the tomes that you were talking about are, you know, right at the end of the 19th century, you know, there's a lot of 18th century um, histories, uh, or there's some 18th century histories, and then we have, um, you know, it's early 20th century. So I think we need a, I think we need a, a 20th century or 21st century uh, new history of Rehoboth to come along. We'll have a lot more Portuguese involved there. Absolutely, um, and it's the Armenian piece, which I know this conversation isn't about the Armenians, but that Armenian piece also needs to be recorded. Um, because um, there are no Armenians in Fall Re in Rehoboth in 1920 that I noted. But in the 1930s, there's a large number of families, and they're, they're clearly leaving Armenia because of the genocide that is happening. Um, and that would be interesting to find out how they end up in Rehoboth. Was it, re was it official government resettlement? Was it because they were looking to buy their own piece of land? So yes, I fully support a writing of a new Rehoboth history um, because Rehoboth is small, but it has an amazing um, 20th century history that needs to be told. So um, absolutely. So Carlos Coutinho um, says, I'm just curious, how would you pronounce my name? Coutinho is actually how I would say it. And Coutinho is actually a, a diminutive of Cotu, C-O-U-T-O. Um, the I N, um, the I N, I N H O is added when something is made a diminutive. It is an actual last name, but just so you know, it's also a diminutive. So it may have started off as Coutinho, but it also may have been a family nickname that um, became the um, um, the actual last name here. Now, I'm curious, how is that pronounced around here? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, it depends. If it's if it's English, I just say Carlos Coutinho. Um, okay. My parents pronounce it Carlos Carlos Quintal Coutinho. That's how they would pronounce my name. Um, Quintal is actually your middle name, and that would yes. um, yeah. That's so, my mother's maiden name. So she came from Madeira. Okay. Yeah. Uh, your parents are pronouncing it in the Portuguese way. Yep. Yeah, and they also, they also, um, since my dad's Carlos, um, or Carlos, um, Carlinhos. <laughs> so yep. I, I get to be two diminutives. Yes. So, yeah, Carlinhos, Carlinhos Quintal, Carlinhos Coutinho. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any other questions? All right, if we don't have any other questions, and of course, um, Sonia provided her email, so I'm sure she would welcome any uh, follow-up questions if you would think of them. Um, thank you so much, Sonia, for coming and talking about this. It was so interesting, and I agree. We need a, a more robust history of later Rehoboth, definitely, because this is fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Um, I found it very interesting, and um i appreciate your your presentation very much oh my pleasure my pleasure so please do follow up with me if you have any questions okay yeah. all right good night everyone and uh, if you want to do a rewatch this should be up uh, by next week on our um on our website cool. all right. Bye. hey thank you bye, good night. Good night.
Good night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you again. Bye-bye.